So today's lecture is basically normally, I mean, I'll give you a little background of what I normally do. I normally work on uh, writing what I think should be a responsible history of uh, the uh, rational sciences in Islam, uh, sciences that are not derived from scripture, namely philosophy, theology, and uh, uh, principles of jurisprudence, uh, mathematics, and so on. And uh, as all of you know, there is uh, something like a, an Orientalist Golden Age myth uh, that there was a period of decline after the first 400 years. I'll talk about that in just a second, but normally the way I, I go about doing these things is that I, I first, uh, well, normally I, the way I do it is that I, I look at technical material. I look at, let's say, a problem in logic and see how it is treated in a set of texts. Uh, it may be, let's say, a discussion of how a subject term in a proposition is treated in various logic, uh, logical works. It may be a discussion of the liar paradox and so on. And the aim in such concentrated studies is to determine what the course of uh, <coughs> rationalism and, and technical studies in these rationalist sciences was in the so-called period of decline. Uh, today I'm going to do something different. Um, I'm going to look at the attitude of Muslim scholars towards science. And it's a very difficult thing to talk about because I'm not really sure what I mean by science. Uh, I'll sort of try to talk about it along the way. We'll determine some kind of a concept or category that we may be able to use. Uh, I suppose the offset I would say something like it's, I, I might want to reduce science to uh, the category of things that, are, you know, sciences that are rational or disciplines that are rational. So philosophy, theology, astronomy, and so on, medicine. Uh, but again, I will not be getting into, into much technical detail. I just want to talk about how the Muslim scholars uh, in the post-classical period, especially in India in the 19th century, uh, thought of the rational sciences. It's just their attitudes uh, that I'm interested in. So uh, let me begin by talking a little bit about the structure of this talk. I will first present, as I often do, whether I'm talking about technical things or general things, I would like to present a grand narrative, this, the existing narrative, which is actually beginning to de deteriorate a little bit now. Uh, there is some work that's been done by my colleagues and me, uh, and we have a very different view of what the, the story of uh, rationalism in Islam should be. Uh, so I'll present the you know, long-standing grand narrative first, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about, in general terms, through some examples, of course, about the Muslim conceptualization of the rationalist and scientific enterprise prior to the 19th century. This is all a setup for what is to come after that. So first, I'll give the grand narrative uh, in about you know, two minutes. That'll be the first part. I will then spend about 15 minutes or so talking about how uh, the attitudes towards the rationalist sciences developed after the so-called Golden Age. And then I look at the end at three examples of how Muslim scholars engage rationalist sciences in the 19th century, specifically in India, and texts that were important in India. So here we go. Uh, basically, the grand narrative is as follows. Uh, we all know that in the 8th century, uh, at the latest, uh, maybe even in the early 8th century, a translation movement was started in the uh, Muslim world, uh, supported by elite and by, um, by caliphs and by governors. Um, the translation movement that uh, included works um, uh, in uh, philosophy and in mathematics uh, and in all kinds of so-called rational sciences. And these works were translated from Greek and from Sanskrit and from Pahlavi to some extent, um, also from Syriac into Arabic. And then there was a naturalization of these sciences in the Islamic tradition. Uh, they, were just, they were not just you know, taken up and regurgitated back to the world. The Muslim scholars read these sciences, they developed them in their own ways and uh, made them uh, their own, they gave it a home. Uh, and of course, it is said uh, in the story of the Golden Age that these uh, scholars made tremendous contributions to, the natural, uh, to, to these rational <coughs> sciences. So we have advanced advancements we know uh, in the field of uh, logic from Farabi and Ibn Sina, for example, uh, and uh, 10th and 11th century scholars. We, uh, we have advancements in medicine and astronomy and so on and so forth. And then the story goes that uh, at the end of, uh, somewhere around the end of the 11th century, at the latest, the middle of the 12th century, there is a uh, decline. This is the end of the Golden Age, and from this point on, traditionalism takes over the Islamic world, the orthodoxy, so-called orthodoxy, again, whatever that means, uh, comes to dominate, and the rationalist sciences basically become stagnant uh, and unimportant in the Islamic tradition. Now, much of this uh, Golden Age narrative is, some, I imagine, is familiar. Uh, some of you are familiar with it. I know that uh, those, who works on, uh, those who work on India, for example, are quite familiar with this uh, narrative. It's a basic Orientalist narrative of a high age and a decline. And Sheldon Pollock, for example, has, has written on this uh, uh, a nice article which, which has in some ways shaped my, way, my own way of thinking about these things. 
So this is a, this is a standard narrative about a high, high point and a decline following that. Um, what my colleagues and I have now decided to do is actually to start looking at the text produced in the post-classical period, namely the period from the 12th to the 19th century, and to see what's going on in these texts. And we have made some interesting discoveries. If you look very closely at texts on astronomy and philosophy and on mathematics and logic and so on, you'll find that the contribution is actually quite immense. In fact, uh, the, the sheer volume of, the, of these uh, texts, the sheer number actually by far exceeds uh, what you would have in uh, Greek and Latin um, combined. Um, much of the work is in commentaries and glosses, so again that has led to the impression that this is a regurgitation of old things. These are school texts that are being used to, to teach uh, students and they have nothing new to say. But if you go deep into them, you begin to find some internal uh, movement and internal progress. Uh, again, I wouldn't talk about the details, but I'm just giving you an overview of what I'm after here. So. Uh, let me just end with the story of the Golden Age. So, so presumably the, the end of this high point of rationalism in Islam comes with a final death knell that comes from Ghazali, a famous uh, theologian and jurist who died in the year 1111. And he is an Ashari theologian, a theologian of a particular uh, brand in Islam, which represents uh, the mainstream Sunni tradition. Uh, and uh, he's basically set, 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 set up as, as a person who is largely responsible for the end of rationalism. So I think it's very important at this point to begin talking about Ghazali's attitude and those who followed him towards the rationalist tradition. And as I usually do things, I give a lot of quotes. Um, so I'm going to bombard you with a lot of quotes and then I'm going to have uh, some comments along the way. Uh, you know. But I think I wouldn't, you wouldn't need too many comments because the quotes speak for themselves. So this is the second part now. We're done with the golden age. Is everybody with me? I, speak, I feel I'm, I'm, a little on a, I'm speaking a bit fast and I'm going to slow down. Um, this was an easy part, so everybody together, yes? Okay, and so uh, now we're in the second part. Um, I want to talk about Muslim understanding of the rationalist or the scientific enterprise. So here are some quotes from the so-called destruction of the philosophers, which is, by the way, a mistranslation. Um, the word is tahafut, which as you will see in, in, in Arabic, it basically means something that crumblings down upon its own weight. So a building would undergo a tahafut, it, it you know, buckles under its own weight. And nicely translated now recently by Michael Murmura as the incoherence of the philosophers. But the impression, even the, tide, the, you know, the Latin destructive as it was translated, also gives the impression that this is an attack on rationalism and so on. Anyway, here's the attack in the tahafut. Ghazali says, we have transmitted this story of the philosophers to let it be known that there is neither firm foundation nor perfection in the doctrine they hold that they judge in terms of surmise and supposition without verification or certainty, that they use the appearance of their mathematical and logical sciences as evidential proof of the truth of their metaphysical sciences, using this as a gradual enticement of the weak of mind. So he begins, the attack is really, as you will get to see in the quotes that follow, is it's an attack on metaphysics. And Ghazali wants to carve out a space for metaphysics by showing that the philosophers, their arguments in spaces, in metaphysical matters do not hold any water. They buckle down under their own weight. And people get impressed by their arguments and follow their metaphysical positions because they're not quite able to handle the logical and mathematical terminology, for example. So in the book, he goes through a number of discussions uh, pointing out, you know, uh, systematically where the metaphysical arguments, the logical argument fails insofar as the syllogism is concerned, insofar as the movement from a premises to conclusions is concerned, insofar as the conclusions contradict their own other conclusions and so on and so forth. So it's a completely rational enterprise that's meant to make the metaphysical enterprise of the philosophers buckle under its own weight. Okay, let's, uh, let's see his attitude towards the rationalist sciences. He says the following, he says, had the philosophers' metaphysical sciences been as perfect in demonstration, free from conjecture as their mathematical, they would not have disagreed among themselves regarding the former, just as they have not disagreed in their mathematical sciences. The second part of their doctrine is one that does not clash with any religious principle and where it is not necessary of the uh, necessary, uh, it is not a necessity of, of the belief in the prophets and God's messengers to dispute uh, with them about, uh, dispute about them. An example of this is their statement, and here's a quote. So here's presumably what the philosophers say. And this is something we do not dispute about Ghazali saying. The lunar eclipse consists in the obliteration of the moon's light due to the interposition of the earth between it and the sun, and uh, the earth being a sphere surrounded by the sky on all sides. This topic is also one 
into the refutation of which we shall not plunge, since this serves no purpose. Whoever thinks that to engage in a disputation for refuting such a theory is a religious duty, harms religion and weakens it. For these matters rest on demonstrations, geometrical and arithmetical, that leave no room for doubt. So I think the quotation speaks for, himself, for itself. Basically, again, to reiterate what I said earlier, he has, he has a problem with philosophers delving in the field of metaphysics, and not a problem in itself, but the problem is that their arguments fail. Uh, they do not work. But when you look at, for example, astronomy, uh, in this case, uh, an issue of eclipse, the eclipses, which is based on mathematical and arithmetical proofs, he has, in fact, not only any, no problem with it, he also thinks it's not a religious duty to meddle in these matters. One can leave such things alone. In other words, he's carving out a lot of space for the rationalist disciplines. In fact, we will see in this quote that he goes rather far in carving out the space. He says the following. If it is said that God's messenger said, quote, so this is a quote, a hadith or a saying from the prophet. If the pro God's messenger said, the sun and moon are two of God's signs that are eclipsed neither for the death nor life of anyone, should you witness such events, then hasten to the remembrance of God in prayer, how then does this agree with what the philosopher states? So this is a question that's being posed. Uh, so how, how does it agree with what the philosopher states? And then Ghazali says, we say, there is nothing in this that contradicts what they have stated, since there is nothing except the denial of the occurrence of the eclipse of, uh, for the death or life of anyone and the command to pray. Why should prayer be seen to contradict the demonstration of the philosophers? If it is said that at the end of this tradition, the prophet said, but if God reveals himself to a thing, it submits itself to him, thereby proving that the eclipse is submission by reason of revelation, we answer, this tradition is not soundly transmitted. So at this point, he's saying, if there is a tradition from the prophet that states that the eclipse happens because the moon and the sun are you know, prostrating before God and so on, then we're not going to accept this tradition because on the basis of demonstration, we have seen that there are other reasons for such things that happen in the skies. So in other words, he's in fact giving an authority to the rational sciences. When these rational sciences and demonstrations, arithmetical and geometrical clash with the revealed texts, you have to either abandon the revealed text or in another passage he says you have to reinterpret them. So there's in fact quite a bit of space that's been created for science. And here is, I think, the final quote that I have for you before I give you a summary of Ghazali and move forward. Uh, the greatest thing in which the atheists rejoice is for the defender of religion to declare that these, that is say astronomical demonstrations and their like are contrary to religion. The inquiry at issue about the world is whether it originated in time or is eternal. This is really what he's concerned with, right? It makes, uh, sorry, moreover, once this temporal origination is established, so once you have proved the metaphysical issue in that, that the, world God, the world has been created by God. Once that's been done, that's what we're really concerned with. It makes no difference whether it is a sphere, a simple body, an octagon, or a hexagon. It makes no difference whether the highest heavens and what is beneath are 13 layers, as they say, or lesser or greater. Metaphysics has nothing to do with these issues. They are investigated in other disciplines. As for metaphysics, we will make it plain that what the philosophers set down as a condition of the truth of the matter of the syllogism is something they have not been able to fulfill in their metaphysical sciences, right? So again, the final point is rather clear, I hope, and it is that it makes no difference how you shape the world. These are, I mean, as you're going to see, other philosophers and theologians are going to pick up this point, and they're going to insist from this point on that what we have in the rational sciences are models. It makes no difference whether your model shows that the world is made up of 13 layers or 17, it makes no difference whether we have one type of uh, you know, shape of the earth, whether it's circular or it's, you know, a hexagon and so on. These are all uh, uh, matters that are irrelevant to religion and metaphysics. Uh, and of course, at the last quote, he's basically pointing out that his issue with, with what the philosophers are doing in metaphysics is that they're not able to show that their syllogism, their logical arguments follow from their premises. That's the main issue he has with them. Is everybody with me at this point? Lots of quotes. Okay. Very good. So here's a summary, right? Ghazali is saying the following. He's saying that principles of logic are sound. Indeed, we're supposed to use them in various disciplines. Perhaps even in metaphysics, it's just that they fail in metaphysics. The failure of the philosophers is in the field of metaphysics. Demonstrations based on reason in all sciences except metaphysics must be accepted. In fact, even at the cost of metaphysics. Uh, uh, when there are such demonstrations, transmitted religious texts that clash with them must be rejected as unsound or they must be reinterpreted. This failure of the rationalists is grounded in their inability to be true to their own rational principle, 
That is to say, they do not deduce properly from their premises to their conclusions while using irrefutable and sound logic. And finally, what the other sciences deduce about the world makes no difference in the matter of religion. And this is, I think I'm stretching the argument a bit, but we're going to see that what I'm going to say now is going to be true for other uh, thinkers. I think perhaps that he's saying that sciences basically provide models for understanding the world. Uh, I don't think he's going that far. It's a bit of a stretch, but you'll see next that there are theologians basically who take up the position that in, when we say that there is no difference in whether you take the world to be circular or a hexagon or whatever, uh, it's not that they're saying that there's no reality to the world, it's basically they have a certain attitude towards science, is that science provides certain models that will have predictive capacity, that will have the capacity to, to evaluate uh, what will happen in the future and so on and so forth. Uh, you may have multiple models as we will see for science. Okay, so let's talk about scientific models. I'm going to give you a couple of examples here. And here, I'm, I, in the next two or three slides, I might get just a little bit technical, but uh, it's going to remain generally rather straightforward. The famous uh, uh, theologian polymath, actually, uh, Nasiruddin Atusi, who died in 1274, wrote a refutation of one of his uh, co uh, co uh, contemporaries, Al-Katabi, who was a very important philosopher and theologian and logician and so on and so forth, who died two years after him. Uh, and uh, these are a bunch of letters and exchanges that they have. And uh, this one particularly uh, has to do with uh, the proof of the contingency of the world and the proof that there is a necessary one which we call God, let's say, right? So Katabi gives a proof, uh, which I'm going to show in just a second. And the proof is important because Tusi's answer hinges on the proof. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the proof. Katabi is, going to, is showing that the world is contingent. It is not necessary in itself. It did not need to exist. It exists because of some other entity, namely something that's necessary in itself. So he needs to give a rational proof of that. Um, so here's his proof. He says, there is existence, right? We all know we're all here. There is some, something called existence. And then he says, if this existence is necessary in itself, namely the world that we see around us, if it is necessary in itself, uh, then of course we have what we set out for, right? Because we have something that's necessary in itself. That's all he wants to prove, done, we're done with. Um, otherwise, if it is not necessary in itself, the cause is contingent in itself and needs another cause, right? So if we have a series of causes in this world, you know, I generate something and that thing generates another. If I'm necessary in myself or this series is necessary in itself, then we're done. Otherwise, we need, a, we need causes, a series of causes. Okay, so if this cause is necessary in itself, then again, we have what we have set out for. Uh, otherwise, uh, sorry, I'm repeating myself. Uh, going back to the cause, sorry. Uh, if the cause, sorry, let me, let me re reiterate, I, I apologize. Um, we have existence, if the existence uh, uh, is necessary in itself, it does not need a cause, then we have what we need. Uh, the other possibility is the existence is contingent and therefore it needs a cause. So now we come to the next point. The cause of this contingent existence is one, either that which is the effects effect, right? So that now we have a circularity. In other words, a thing, thing's cause is its own effect. So that's one possibility that we have for understanding the cause. The other possibility is that this cause is something uh, that is other than the effect, right? So, this, so that we avoid circularity. So this thing that is other than the contingent uh, 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 entity is either something necessary, and again, we got what we set out for, or the other possibility is that there is another contingent cause of this cause. So in other words, we have a perpetual series, right? So either, either at some point, what he's trying to say, either you end up with a necessary in itself, something that's not caused by something else, or you end up with a contingent cause, and that needs an explanation. Okay, we know that he says that B is false, right? Um, uh, because then we get a composite series of causes and effects, which is in itself contingent, right? So basically saying, look, here's, here's what you're going to end up with. If you have a series of contingent causes, right, and you put them all in a whole, you have a series of contingent things, which series itself is going to be as a whole contingent, right? So because all elements within it are contingent. So that doesn't work. So the composite, this composite of all contingent things, namely our entire world, let's say, our created contingent world, it is either uh, the composite itself, or it is some part of the composite, maybe some element within this larger series of contingent things, or something that's outside of the composite. Number one is false, because then we have a thing being its own cause and effect. This is circularity, that doesn't work. Number two is false, because we have a contingent element in a larger series which is causing other contingent elements but it needs explanation for itself so it's causing itself circularity again therefore outside of the series of contingent created <coughs> entities there must be one necessary cause that's outside of that series yeah 
That's the argument. Now, the argument itself, I'm sorry, I apologize for, for spending three minutes on it, or five minutes perhaps, but the argument in itself has a very important element here, and Tusi actually hits on it. So his response is very simple. He says, we do not accept that this argument leads to what Katabi was after, namely proving that there's a necessary entity outside of the contingent entities. For from the existence of that which is necessary in itself, necessary in itself insofar as nothing among the other things you have set up in this fashion is necessary in itself, it does not follow that there should be an existent necessary in itself without reference to any modality. What he's saying is basically this, sort of a long sentence. He's saying that if you set up uh, uh, the matter in the fashion in which you have set it up, then of course you're going to get a necessary entity at the end of the day. He's saying that the, what you have here is a system that you have created for me. Right? The expression he uses in Arabic is ala hada taqdeer, in this fashion. If you measure things out in this fashion, yes, of course you're going to get a necessary existence at the end of the day. But this is not a proof, a positive proof of the existence of something necessary outside of the way things have been set up, outside of the system or the model that you have set up for me here. Right? Effectively, he's arguing the following. It is a particular model with certain assumptions about necessities and contingencies, about their relationship, you know, cause and effect relationship, their existence of the entire set of contingencies and so on, is this specific model that leads to the proof of the ex existence of the necessary in itself. But this proof works only within the assumptions granted in this model. And the other point that he makes, he's making is that the proof works insofar as other possibilities within the model are refuted. This does not prove that the necessary in itself exists without reference to any modality or model, right? So, so just to repeat myself, what Tusi is saying, look, if you set up, again, to, if you set up things in the fashion which you have, that there is a, there is a whole, a majmu, uh, you know, totality of contingent things, that these contingent things cause each other, that they're in a series, in a temporal series, perhaps, then if you set things up in this fashion, then of course, by definition, you're going to get a necessary being. But this is not a positive proof of a necessary being outside of a model that you have set up. So in a, as we are as we're going to see as I move forward, the issue is going to be about models. The attitude towards science and rationality uh, in, among Muslim philosophers is actually quite, if I might use the expression, modern attitude that we find uh, among, the, for example, with Hume, as I'm going to show, with Quine um, and uh, with uh, Duhem, for example. Uh, the idea is that scientific theories are nothing more than models. That's all they are. Okay, and so let's talk about models in astronomy. Um, and actually how Muslim uh, uh, astronomers actually uh, dealt with the issue of multiple models. So this is, of course, a s very simplified version of Ptolemy, the famous Ptolemy's uh, astronomy. Uh, he's an author who died in 168. And this is a simplified model of his motion of the sun. And it consists of two possibilities of imagining how the sun moves around the earth. One of them is this. Uh, <coughs> sorry, where's the center? Is this this? Yeah. <laughs> One of them is, this is the earth, right? And this is the circumference around the Earth with the Earth as at the center of the universe. And this is something called a deference. So when you, ha when you have a circle on which there's another circle that's moving around, the circle is called an epicycle. Uh, and on this circle, on this epicycle, you have this dot. This would be the sun. So basically, the way you would imagine the circle, you, you basically have to get predictive capacity for the movement and location of the sun. Right? That's what Ptolemy's model does. So if you have... If you posit the Earth as the center, you have the circle around that center called a deferent. On this deferent is this thing called an epicycle. The sun is right here. This dot is moving this way. This is not a real dot. There's nothing on this dot. This is not the sun. It's just a hypothetical dot. And this dot is moving this way, and then the sun is going this way. So it's going to keep going this way. And it's going to move at a certain velocity. And if you have this model, you're going to be able to predict, again, this is a simplified version, you're going to be able to predict the location of the sun according to this model with the Earth at the center. The other model that Ptolemy proposes, it all works equally well for predictions uh, with different velocities and so on, is that he takes the Earth at the center of the universe, certainly, but he draws another circle off the center. And this is the red circle. It's called the eccentric, off-center. Yeah? And if you posited things in this fashion, and, and the sun is here, and is moving around this red dot, uh, red line along the way, you're going to have the same predictive capacity. Right? So you have two different models of imagining the world both of them deliver the location of the sun as you would find it out there, right? Now, his model of the motion of Jupiter and other things is even more complex, but very simplified version, again, is that you have the Earth here, and you have a center here along which the circle is drawn. So this is, again, the deferent, right? It's called the deferent because you have this other circle, hypothetical circle on it, called the epicycle. The problem with Jupiter is that 
if this is Jupiter, if it's moving this way along the circle at a certain velocity, you will not be able to you'll not be able to have accurate predictions. So you have to calculate the velocity with reference relative to another imaginary dot, dot called the equant. If you if you if you conclude if if you calculate the relative um, uniform velocity of Jupiter with relation to this point, not in relation to the Earth and not in relation to the center of the equant, you're also going to get predictive capacity for the movement of Jupiter. So as you can see, there are these models that are being created to give predictive capacities and Ptolemy's system was actually quite accurate in, able to, in, in being able to tell you where the stars and the planets and, and so on are going to be. But it's actually, this is a simplified version, it's a very, very complex model. Uh, the problem with the model, so we have a predictive capacity, the problem with the model was that, and this was a major problem that led to the development of astronomy in, in Islam and also to the development of the Copernican system at the end of the day. Uh, the problem with it is that it did not sit well with major and important principles of Aristotelian physics. Three of them are as follows. Uh, Aristotelian physics and philosophy tells you, number one, that there has to be uniform motion, right? Things cannot, you know, go like this slowly and then go fast and then go slowly. Motion in the heavens has to be uniform because the heavens are simple, right? Uh, the, the second thing is that the motion has to be circular in the heavens. Uh, and uh, the third principle he has is that uh, the heavens themselves are simple and they are non-divisible. In other words, there cannot be any relative velocity uh, in the heavens because they are created of the same matter. They're, they're, they're not like uh, the sublunar world. So these are three principles and as you have seen from the models, all of these principles are in one way or another violated by Ptolemy. Uh, the predictive capacity that he gives us requires a measurement of rel relative speed around multiple equants, right? Uh, you saw that he had to construct this imaginary thing with relative velocity. If you give a relative velocity of the movement of Jupiter with, uh, in, uh, in relation to the equant, an observer of the sun, uh, an observer at the earth is going to be able to predict where Jupiter is going to be. You're going to observe Jupiter moving faster and slower from the earth, but he's arguing, no, it's actually moving at the same velocity relative to another point. Yeah? So, number one, you have violated principles one and three. Uh, you've also established spheres with centers other than the Earth. The Earth is supposed to be the actual physical center of the universe, and now you have posed, you know, uh, eccentrics and equants and so on, so that violates another principle of Aristotelian uh, uh, philosophy and physics. So, basically, it is in view of these problems, this clash between philosophy on the one hand, and you might even say religion, because if you have uh, the idea that the Earth is at the center and things are homocentric, co-centric, moving around it and so on, then you have a problem. So it's in view of this clash between astronomical models and philosophy and religion on the other hand that Muslim philosophers actually began, astronomers began to propose new models. So this is a famous one of Ibn al-Shatir who died in 1375. By the way, note we're outside of the so-called golden age. Things are still going strong in the post-classical period. And he proposed some very nice models. One of them is this, whereas as you can see, there are no eccentrics and no equants. He gets rid of them. Uh, the problem is, of course, he does have epicycles, which nobody wants because those are also imaginary things. And we don't want imaginary things in the system. Uh, in 1311, uh, another scholar died, Shiraz, called Budina Shirazi, and then after him, Shamsuddin al Khafri, they also propose new models. Uh, they understand astronomy. As you're going to see from this point on, from Tusi onwards, the astronomers and philosophers begin to understand astronomy as providing mathematical models. And Shirazi, was so committed to this position that he in fact presented nine different models for the equant of Mercury and all of them had accurate predictive capacity. He actually chose one at the end of the day. He was a little bit more committed than one would want, but uh, Khafri was not committed to any model actually. He said all of them are fine. And in fact, famously, both of them in different lo locations mention that there is a mathematical equation uh, equivalence of various models that can be proposed for the universe. So the point I'm trying to make here is that the attitude of Muslim religious scholars, and by the way, these astronomers, I forgot to mention a crucial point, they're all religious scholars too. They're producing works in, uh, in legal theory and in law, and of course sitting as, as judges and muftis and so on and so forth in their relative uh, locations. Uh, the attitude of these religious scholars towards science is that science provides models. Uh, it may or may not correspond to reality, but that's irrelevant because that's, that has to do with metaphysics. Uh, science has its own domain and it can function quite well without these commitments. If I might give one more example, I think this is my last one, yep, before I give the summary and move forward to the 19th century. You can even go to a, 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 a madrasa text in theology. This is one of the most famous texts taught in Muslim madaris from the time it was written. It has many, many, many countless 
uh, commentaries and glosses uh, written in the Ottoman world, in the Safavid world, and in, uh, in, in the Mughal world, and so on. And in this uh, text, this uh, is a lar rather large text of several volumes currently being held hostage by a colleague of mine, uh, <laughs> we shall not be named. Uh, uh, right. <laughs> uh, I should I should say that I do not want this colleague to think that I want it back. I'm just joking. So anyway, if you go to this to this compendium, there's a section on astronomy, and this is what uh, after after presenting the various uh, astronomical models, uh, e.g., the author says the following. He says, "These are imagined things and have no existence in the external world, but there is no objection to things like this. Nor are there th things, nor nor are these things related to matters of creed." nor indeed can one definitively confirm or falsify these things. We mention them only so that you may understand there, namely the astronomer's intentions. If you see these things as mere models, thinner than the house of a spider, listening to these words would not do you any harm. Right, so go out, construct your models. They will not do you any harm. Of course, there is, you know, not, not all thinkers thought in this fashion. So his commentator, Jurjani, has a slightly different attitude and he says the following. One may say that there is no doubt that if a sphere moves on its axis without moving from its place, then one may suppose there to be two points that have no movement at all. Uh, these are called the poles, right? So he's saying, okay, imagine there's a sphere, it's going round. Okay, if you set things up in this fashion, you're going to imagine there are going to be two poles and not going to move. Uh, and one may suppose a great circle between these two poles, located in the middle of the poles, such that, mo such that movement on this circle would be fast. And he's talking about the equator. So, okay. So there's going to be one circle in the sphere, it's going to go faster than the others. And one may suppose on both sides of this equator, other smaller circles, right? You know, the sphere gets bigger and larger on, on both sides. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, where the movement would be slow in relation to the movement on the equator, and what is closer to the pole would be slower than what is closer to the equator. These things and other like them, even if they do not exist in external reality, he's granting that they may not exist in external reality, are supposed things that are imagined correctly. And they correspond to the way things are without regard to their modality of their existence outside or in the mind. The point he's making is this. He's saying when you set up a mathematical model, it is coherent in itself. The system has a reality. When I set up a sphere, a sphere has certain properties. It may not be that the world looks like a sphere, but if you set it up in this fashion, if you call the world a sphere and you can sort of show it through predictive capacity, then other things mathematically and logically will fall. I'm not saying that this corresponds to reality, I'm this, I am saying that this is a mathematical reality, right? It's a model. So this is the general attitude that one finds among Muslim theologians and astronomers and philosophers towards the rationalist enterprise, all the way from Ghazali onwards into the 16th, 17th century. And I'll go to the 19th century in just a second. So here's a quick summary. Here are the few, a few fundamental um, um, attitudes to the rationalist and scientific enterprise. And number one, the rationalist enterprise is built on premises from which one deduces conclusions by means of methods established in logic, right? And you did not see quotations from scripture and so on. They're creating a nice clean space for mathematical models in the rationalist sciences. In various fields, observation is a requirement for the production of scientific knowledge. In other words, having predictive capacity. You cannot just make a mathematical model. You can if you want, but you know, if you're going to use it for astronomical predictions, you have to have some observations and so on. When the demonstrations of rationalist disciplines differ from the pronouncements of the transmitted religious texts pertaining to the subject matter of these disciplines, the scriptural proofs have to be reinterpreted and considered unauthentic. This is from Ghazali that I'm taking. Yeah, you guys saw that quote. Metaphysics and theology are not harmed by what one discovers in the rationalist disciplines, again from Ghazali, and in fact also from E.G., you guys just saw it. And lastly, points are interesting in view of what I'm going to tell you next for just a few seconds after this. Fields like astronomy, medicine, logic, and so on provide us with models which may or may not correspond to reality. There's no problem with that. These models have an intelligible reality, not necessarily a reality in the outside world. Uh, they are internally consistent systems and have predictive capacities. Since we're only talking about models, their predictive capacity does not mean that there is an, uh, a real or causal relation between the model and reality, nor is there any commitment to a model. As you saw in, in, in uh, Shirazi and Khafri, there is not, they're not committed to any particular model as fully proven or uh, determined. I think what's going on here is something very close to what happens in 
uh, in the 20th century, in fact, starting in the 18th century, Western philosophical discourse on science. And uh, I'm usually rather uncomfortable with bringing so-called modernity into discussions of Islamic rationalism, but I think here the, the case is very clear, so I'm going to do it anyway. I, do, I don't like setting up Islamic rationalism in relation to something else. It is its own thing and has to be discovered and its concepts and categories have to be realized in, fr from the text themselves. But, but here I think it's quite useful. So here's a brief segue and from Hume and uh, uh, Duhem, Pierre, Pierre Duhem uh, and uh, Willard van Orban Quine on the nature of the validity of scientific methods. Hume says the following, something like the following on induction. And this is, this is a very nice point on how induction actually gives you only models and itself is not, does, does not really have any capacity to prove anything. So if I, for example, for the past 40 years, observe that whenever it is Sunday, Professor X is in the church, right? So for the past 40 years, every Sunday, Professor X is found in the church. I, will, I might draw the conclusion that in future Sundays, I will find Professor X in the church. And all of you might say this is a pretty decent conclusion. <coughs> the problem with this is that I need to justify this second claim about the future. And I need to just, I would justify it by another general, con, uh, general proposition, which will be whenever, over the course of 40 years, you, found, you find someone in a church on Sunday, you can conclude that on future Sundays, that person will be in church, right? You need that kind of a general proposition in order to take particular observations and use them for general predictive capacity for the future. This is the problem of induction, actually. And then I will say what justifies this proposition? Well, an observation over 40 years that those who are in church on Sunday are also there in the future, which is an induction. In other words, you cannot prove an induction. Induction actually remains relevant to the set with which it is concerned. Uh, or to put it differently, it provides only a model, which has no capacity really to prove anything at all. Um, so in other words, general, this is Hume's position, general knowledge, that is say models require generalization over the individually observed instances and this generaliz generalization itself requires an induction and so on and so forth. So induction is circular, it cannot be proven, it only gives you models uh, which do not allow you to go beyond the particular observations. And this idea of induction uh, as found in Hume, and by the way he doesn't really use this expression in this fashion, but th the point is the same. Uh, is picked up later on in the philosophy of physics by Duhem, and then later on picked up by the famous philosopher, one of my favorite uh, analytical philosophers, Quine, who died in 2000. Uh, the point they're making is this. When you do science, they say that no hypothesis in isolation can be proved to be true on the basis of any observation uh, in isolation. So for example, what you have are systems, right? So let's say, let's, let me give you an example. Here's a system uh, of the world uh, where, um, the sun always comes up on the east, right? Comes out on the east, and I have, a, I have a, the sun. I also observe the sun come out on the east, and there's a whole system, a Copernican system, let's say, which which has its own hypotheses and conclusions and assumptions and so on, which is giving you that predictive capacity. On a certain day, it doesn't come out on the east; it comes out in the west. You have not refuted. You're not sure which part of this larger system you're refuting. It could be any part that fell apart. It might be, you know, the first assumption or the last conclusion. Uh, the point with in, with these inductive models is that no theory in isolation can be refuted and also cannot be proven, right? These are, these are nothing more than models. Uh, what you can show uh, is that a system is confirmed or disproven, the system itself, not any particular hypothesis within, within it. Uh, and of course, this does not mean that the system itself is correct, right? Uh, no system, obviously, this is a pretty straightforward point, no system can prove itself its truth depends on its consistency with other systems, right? So basically the point, the, the view of science now, the modern view of science now is that you have a set of hypotheses in a system, let's call it an astronomical system model one. These hypotheses have to be internally consistent. They have to give you predictive capacity. When you see an observation that does not sit well with the system, you're actually at quite a loss as to which hypothesis within the system you're going to chuck out. You can actually throw out the entire system if you want. At that point, you have to make a choice. So basically working with models. And of course this whole model itself is linked to other assumptions and other principles and conclusions and other sciences. In other words, the modern uh, notion of scientific and the scientific enterprise seems to be rather close to what the Muslim uh, uh, theologians and philosophers and astronomers were saying. What we have are models, that's all we work with. And the idea that science, I mean the naive idea that science actually gives you the truth or gives you some kind of a reality and so on is actually for the philosophers of science is actually complete bogus and bogus nonsense. Uh, uh, all we have are models. 
Okay, having said all of this, basically now you have a, a sense of what Muslim uh, philosophers and astronomers and so on thought about the scientific enterprise. I'm going to end with three, I'll actually come now to the title of my talk. <laughs> I think I needed to do all this setup to make my point, I think. Uh, I'm going to give you three examples of Muslim eg engagements with science in the 19th century. And here's um, the first one. I think it's a quite, a neat, quite a neat one. Uh, and in order to set it up, I have to go back to the classical Ptolemaic astronomy system and uh, Aristotelian cosmology. There's a very famous uh, scholar called Athiruddin al-Abhari, who died in 1265, wrote a book called Hidayat al-Hikmah, among others. And uh, another scholar, Fazal Khairabadi, who died in 1861, he's from India, he wrote, a, among other things, a book called Al-Hadiyya Saidiya. And uh, both of them have the same following argument, so I don't have to repeat both of them, right? So they want to give the proof uh, that the cosmos is spherical, right? So we're, we're basically, the Earth is at the center and there's this globe around us, yeah? That's what they want to prove. Here's how they do it. They say the directions up and down are distinct from each other by their very nature. This is proposition number one. Up and down are different from each other. And, and the proof of this, they say, look, we look at the world, we look at the elements, we see that the fire tends to move upward, upwards, earth moves downwards. This is the Aristotelian stuff, by the way. Fire move, moves upwards, so it has a talab, it has a desire to go in a certain direction and end in a certain direction. Earth, uh, you know, the things on this earth, the heavy things fall down on the earth and they have a you know, desire to, to, to be as, as the farthest, the lowest position. This shows that there is an absolute up and absolute down, they say. Now, two things distinct from each other by their very natures, obviously, cannot be interchanged for each other. So therefore, if I've shown that there is an absolute up and an absolute down, they cannot be switched around because they have distinct natures. If you switch them around, then they don't have distinct natures. So if, if they're essentially different, then they cannot be substituted for each other. Now, by the way, they do grant that there is a relative up and down. I could be sitting on the table, and in relation to the table, I'm up, and, you know, the table in relation to me is down, and so on and so forth. You could have relative up and down, but there's also such a thing as absolute up and absolute down in relation to which I establish my relative position to something else, right? Uh, to put it slightly differently, I'm on top of, I'm up in relation to the table because I'm closer to the absolute up, and the table is not as close to the absolute up in relation to me. Okay, now, having said this, they say that things that are closer to the real or absolute up are said to be up in relation to those things that are farther from the real or absolute up. And then by definition, the absolute up is farthest from the absolute down, right? Everybody with me, right? So if there's an absolute up and there's an absolute down, well, by the very definition, they have to be absolutely far from each other. Once you have set this up, basically, you have set up a sphere, right? What he's basically giving you is a definition of a circle with a radius, right? So if, if there's... If I assume that this is an absolute down and there's a farthest point, let's say my arm is the farthest point, that's the absolute up. I'm making a sphere, yeah, a circle of some sort. That's it. So by using the definition of up and down and setting up absolute up and down, he has proven, so to speak, again, starting off with a certain model and certain definition, he has proven that though the cosmos is spherical, it's a globe of certain of a certain so a sort. Now, here's a critique that comes from Ahmad Raza Khan Barelvi, the founder, if I might use that expression, of the famous Barelvi movement in India. The book itself consists of refutations of Ptolemaic and Copernican astronomy in the fashion that you see here. Uh, it has, it's, it's an amateurish work, but I think it's still interesting for some of its parts. So here's, here's what he says. He says, um, they look for an endpoint for up. The philosophers have an argumentative strategy in which they say that up is not something imagined. Remember, the same ideal model is coming up here, right? He's saying, they're saying that this is something real. It's not imagined, but something that exists, something that's real. And whatever exists must have some kind of limit and absolute definition. They give the following proofs for the existence of up. The first is that, like down, up is also naturally sought by certain bodies. I've already explained this to you. And what is, well, uh, sorry, what is sought cannot be non-existence or merely imagined, right? So here's the fire, fire always goes up. It is far as seeking something, cannot be seeing something imagined, must be real, there must be an absolute up. This is, I'm just repeating the argument. In fact, he's repeating it. He says the following, say, I say, everything that is heavy seeks closeness to what is the absolute down in proportion to its heaviness. Sounding a bit like gravity, by the way. Uh, actually, Newton's law of uh, mutual universal gravitation. I, I wouldn't go so far, but sounding a little bit like it, but that's not my interest here. <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, and I may, even, I may then say that everything that is light seeks distance from the absolute down in proportion to its lightness. 
In other words, if we set it up differently, instead of saying the fire is seeking what's up there, and therefore there must be an absolute up, I can say actually that which is heavy seeks what is down, that which is light seeks distance from what is down. I don't need an absolute up. So by this way of thinking about things, we can say that everything that is light neither seeks what is up, nor is up some specific and determined thing that is sought out by what is light. Uh, and then he says the following. Just to make his point clear, he says, Qutbuddin Shirazi, whom you've already met, that astronomer, he says, said the following rather interesting thing. Nine different models for nine different skies. That's nothing. I can even, it can even be possible that the fixed stars are stationed inside something like the orb of Saturn, such that they move with its movement along with the rest of the planets. It would then only seem that they're not moving. So basically what he's saying, look, we have fixed stars, right? They're always there. They don't move. Okay. That's fine. I'm at the Earth. I'm, they're always there. Everything else is moving around them. What if I imagine that this whole system is inside another system which is moving, right? So I wouldn't be able to tell these things are moving because I'm also moving with them, right? That's why they look like they're fixed. So that's another model I can propose. So basically saying, uh, Ahmad Raza Khan Barelvi, who died in 1921, is saying something very similar to what we encountered earlier. These are just models. These are imagined things. They're imagined in the sense they're mathematical models. I can give you other ones too. They do not correspond to reality. Uh, another example, and I have only two more and then we'll be done, I've been talking for a while. Another example is from the famous Ashraf Ali Thanwi who died in a, a 1943, uh, Indian scholar. <clears throat> he says the following, among matters in which science disagrees with the reports transmitted in the Islamic tradition are the nature of thunder, lightning and rain. The falsification of the reported accounts is merely on the basis of the fact that we have used certain instruments to observe the creation of these things by other means. This falsification is not valid because there is no contradiction between these two things. If there were a contradiction, then certainly observation would have compelled one to assert the truth of one claim and the falsity of the other. But there is no real contradiction here. It is entirely possible that sometimes one kind of cause, in other words, one kind of model, a system, uh, results in the creation of these things and some other kind of cause results uh, in their creation. Uh, so basically you have thunder, lightning and so on, you could say, okay, look, you know, I'm showing through certain observation use of certain instruments that there are causes other than what are pr provided in the scripture uh, for the creation of thunder, lightning and so on. That's okay, because it doesn't mean that the two, are, the two causes uh, are mutually exclusive. They do not contradict each other. Uh, and then he says the transmitted religious reports make no universal claim about such things, right? So the transmitted texts are not saying that this is the only cause of lightning and thunder. In other words, he's carving out a space for science, even here, right? He says, moreover, and this I've highlighted because I think it's important in view of what we've said about induction and so on. He says, moreover, observation cannot lead to a universal affirmative claim of the sort every A is B. Indeed, we all know that two particular claims of the sort, some A is B and some A is not B, may both be true. Universality and universal laws cannot be deduced from induction, istiqra, applied to particular instances, no matter how many. Right, so it's, again, the same idea that's being expressed again. This is a distrust of science, science providing a reality. It's not distrust of science as far as it provides mathematical models that may be useful. Um, in fact, in, in my view, it's a rather sophisticated attitude, attitude towards science. And then he talks about examples of plague and movement of the earth and so on, and they treat it in the same fashion, right? In other words, he says, observations need not contradict uh, revealed uh, traditions, and they, they will not give you universal, uh, you know, un, you know uh, models that, are, that cannot be disproved. Um, that's the point he's making. The last example I'll, make, uh, I'll give is from Hussain bin Muhammad uh, al-Trabutsi. He's not, obviously, an Indian, but his text, the moment it came out, Risala al-Hamidiyya, became very, very important in India. And he had, a, for about 20 years after his death, he had a rather important uh, uh, place in the study of uh, science among uh, scholars, Muslim scholars in India. So that's why I've included him here. He says, uh, those who follow Muhammad believe in immediate creation. So he's talking about Darwinism. It's important to bring that out finally, right? Because that's one thing everyone, talk, everyone talks about. Those who follow Muhammad believe in immediate creation, not evolution. And the expression used is irtaqa. Apparently that's the term that was being used for evolution. They're not supposed to give allegorical interpretations of verses and to reduce their meanings to something else unless, unless a rational and certain proof is given that God created man by way of evolution as they, the Darwinians, claim. If that proof can be given, the Muslims would be forced to give allegorical interpretations of the verses, as is the rule when the rational and transmitted proofs contradict each other. So the qaida is the expression he used. There's a qaida or a rule that when revealed and rationalist proofs, demonstrations, 
uh, when they contradict, as Ghazali also showed many, many centuries ago, you have to let go of the, or reinterpret rationalist traditions. But there is no such proof, he says, of evolution. There is no proof. There is only observation of instances of microscopic entities, uh, microscopii, <laughs> uh, birds and apes, and there is a theory to explain these observations. But it is known that observations give no absolute and universal rules for preferring one imagined model over another. If the transmitted account is to be replaced by allegorical interpretation, some absolute rules for induction must be given that are not circular. So he's basically echoing a lot of things that I've already talked to, said to you about induction and models and so on. So in other words, the attitude towards science seems to be throughout, from Ghazali onwards, rather sophisticated. I have not got into the discussion of the contributions in astronomy and logic and so on. I'll be happy to give some examples if you wish along the way, but I wanted to keep this as little, as, you know, as non-technical as possible. This was a talk about attitudes. And as you can see, they're rather sophisticated. Uh, just let me give a quick summary now in, in 30 seconds. Uh, we see from Ghazali and Tusi that metaphysics is something suppo is some, supposed to be distinct from other disciplines. And there's plenty of room for other disciplines to do whatever they feel like. And the place of metaphysics is, is reserved, again, not because it's sacred for Ghazali, but because the logical proofs simply fail. They just buckle under their own weight. Ghazali and Tusi also highlight the importance of going soundly from certain accepted premises to conclusions to create these models. Tusi, Shirazi, Khafri, E.G. Georgiani, and Bareilly, and so on, also stress that hypotheses that are proposed in sciences are nothing other than hypotheses. You can have a million hypotheses on the basis of a set of uh, observations. You cannot have absolute proof of universal hypotheses. They're just models and systems. And again, create as many as you like. Uh, that's not a problem. And finally, induction, of course, is something. The problem of induction, the philosophical problem of induction, insofar as it relates to science, is talked about by E.G. Jurjani, Thanavi, and Prabulsi. I think I would like to end with a quote I cannot remember, but I'll try to reproduce it. I think it's from, uh, it might have been from Carnap or perhaps Quine or somebody. I read it many years ago. And it was something like induction is uh, the, uh, the triumph of science, uh, but, but the shame or the bane of philosophy, right? The point is that for, from a philosophical point of view, uh, the scientific method is actually very problematic. And this is what the Muslims are pointing out, Muslim scholars. But of course, induction is what one needs, one what does in creating models in science. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.